Good morning, everyone. My name is Marcel Polednik, and I have the distinct honor and privilege of serving as the Donna and Donald Baumgartner Director of this Milwaukee Art Museum. Welcome to the museum today, and thank you for joining us for the second day of the Milwaukee Model, envisioning the role of the arts in criminal justice reform. This symposium is co-organized by the Haggerty Museum of Art and the Milwaukee Art Museum in conjunction with Sable Elise Smith, Ordinary Violence, on view at the Haggerty through January 27th, and the San Quentin Project, Nigel Poor and the Men of San Quentin State Prison, on view here at the Milwaukee Art Museum through March 10th. <coughs> Events like this are not possible without the generosity of our sponsors. I would like to begin by thanking them for bringing us together today. Our presenting sponsors for the symposium include Bader Philanthropies, Brico Fund, and the Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Our community outreach sponsor is the Riva and David Logan Foundation, and our media sponsor is WUWM 89.7, Milwaukee's NPR. Please join me in thanking our sponsors. I would also like to thank our advisory committee who was instrumental in shaping these events the other symposium participants in attendance, and the symposium co-organizers, Emilia Layden, Curator of Collections and Exhibitions at the Haggerty Museum, and Lisa Sutcliffe, the Hertzfeld Curator of Photography and Media Arts at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Art has a history of exploring the issues of its time. It invites engagement, questions perceptions, and challenges what appear to be norms. With this symposium, for which the museum is proud to be partnering with the Haggerty Museum of Art, we present art as a means through which we might otherwise approach the conversations around incarcerated individuals and the criminal justice system in our community. The Milwaukee model offers the opportunity to hear from artists and experts from around the country, as well as groups working in Milwaukee, as they discuss how arts and educational programming might shift perceptions of the criminal justice system and incarcerated individuals. At the keynote last evening, we heard from Elizabeth Hinton, Associate Professor of History and African and African American Studies at Harvard University, and author of From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America and also Christian Viveros Fonet, art and culture critic, curator, and author of Social Forms, A Short History of Political Art, who provided a broad historical framework for our artist-led panels today. This morning, I'm delighted to welcome a diverse group of scholars, artists, educators, and practitioners who will explore the role of the arts in advancing criminal justice reform efforts. Today's presentations will highlight several arts-based initiatives that have been successfully implemented across the United States. Following today's panels, please join us for a reception where we hope to continue the conversations that are begun on stage today. Finally, we hope you will join us tomorrow at Eckstein Hall for the conclusion of the symposium, a community day of action, during which community members and stakeholders are invited to consider how national models or artistic strategies presented today could be adapted and implemented regionally. A series of artist-led workshops will be followed by facilitated breakout discussions with symposium speakers. In order to enable participants to use their allotted time for conversation, we will not introduce each speaker, but instead invite you to find their biographies in the symposium program, which is also available on our website, www.mam.org backslash M-K-E-M-O-D-E-L, for those watching the live stream. And now, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sam Aranke, Dr. Simone Brown, and artist Sable Elise Smith for our first panel, No Humans Involved, Structures and Systems. Please join me in welcoming them. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I am so humbled to be here today to be in conversation with Simone and Sable. I'm going to offer some framing notes and then dive right into the conversation. Oh, except I need my little thicker dinner. Okay. Dear colleagues, you may have heard a radio news report which aired briefly during the days after the jury's acquittal of the policeman in the Rodney King beating case. The report stated that public officials of the judicial system of Los Angeles routinely use the acronym NHI to refer to any case involving a breach of the rights of young black males who belong to the jobless category of the inner city ghettos. NHI means no humans involved. So begins the anti-colonial and feminist scholar Sylvia Winter's May 1992 open letter to her colleagues at Stanford University penned shortly after the April 29th verdict, acquitting, um, which acquitted the officers responsible for Rodney King's brutal beating. Winter, in her rich and dynamic essay, suggests that this police designation points us to a broader historical and theoretical problem that has to do with how the category of humanness is itself vexed. To put it very crudely, Winter, in a roller coaster of an essay, asks us to reconsider the progressivist logics we assume when we utter the word human, as the category's roots in Western theories of enlightenment presume a racial, classed, gendered, and sensorial set of logics that are not always made available to us all. While there are several impactful and insightful passages in Winter's open letter, the most striking is her insistent return to visibility and perceptibility. She turns our attention to what she calls, extending from Ralph Ellison, the inner eyes, which constitute the training behind our perception, our subjective ways of seeing. For Winter, part of the work of understanding the histories, systems, and structures that give rise to conditions like, for example, the prison industrial complex, is to engage in a riotous rebellion against these inherited modes of perception, to unlearn those inner eyes that we've inherited, and to make them anew. Surveillance is one of many modes that govern these inner eyes. Simone, in her brilliant book, Dark Matters, poetically names, quote, the surveillance of blackness as often unperceivable within the study of surveillance, blackness being that non-nameable matter that matters the racialized disciplinary society. In what is absolutely my favorite chapter of the book, she unpacks New York City ordinances that required black, mixed race, and indigenous slaves to carry small lamps when escorted by white people at night, or when unescorted, rather, by white people at night. The cover of the night was considered to be a threat for whites precisely because of how the dark inhabits total, or inhibits total visibility, thus making it extremely difficult to track the movements of non-white peoples. So it makes disturbing sense to mandate a forced relationship to being seen so as to make surveillance and policing easier. The, this history of surveillance calls attention to, the, to coerced perceptibility and the expectation to remain exposed and visible. This is what Winter might call a scene of instruction for those inner eyes, where our expectations for non-white people is to remain in plain view to be made available to those surveilling, um, to those policing eyes. I think this concern with the perceptible that Winter and Simone elaborate is why Sable so provocatively suggested we title today's discussion after Winter's letter. Having had the pri privilege of writing for her incredible show at the Haggerty, I can say without hesitation that Sable's work asks us to reconsider the ordinary exposures of black life. In her work, structures are broken down into ubiquitous moments, experiences, affects, and senses. It's within these moments of what the artist calls ordinary violence that we might begin to see the tenderness of pain, a non-spectacular scene to subjection, a poetic grammar of the everyday, a palpable illumination of the seemingly imperceptible. Taking Winter's format of an open letter seriously, I hope that we can turn to dialogue as a mode to, to trouble the, the less visible modes that shape our understanding of the prison industrial complex and its impact on our everyday lives. 
For today's discussion, I've asked Sable and Simone to present for 10 minutes on a thought, provocation, problem, or subject of interest between them. From there, we'll go into a couple of ready-made questions from me, and then opening it up for a discussion from all of you who are alert and caffeinated, right, for us today. Um, but enough from me. Without further wait, please join me in welcoming Sable to the podium. Um, okay, so for my portion today, which I'll probably also explain um, a little bit as I start um, talking, I'm going to kind of, uh, I guess, describe um, or sort of set the tone by uh, providing these three different, or sorry, four different sort of images. Um, two um, I'll open with um, sort of come from um, this recent um, installation, which I'll kind of talk about a little bit in the beginning, and then two images as well as this kind of like reoccurring theme that I found um, every time I kind of um, go back into Simone's book, which is something I think about a lot as I'm sort of making work, thinking about work, and also thinking about the language that's sort of used um, in relationship to the work um, that I'm interested in making. So, um, so I guess I've been uh, spending a lot of time thinking about this sort of refrain, um, and I kind of talk about refrains a lot, so if you've heard me speak before, this won't be new, um, but that I found sort of uh, throughout Simone's book, um, and especially in the epilogue, which I spent um, a lot of time thinking about, um, which is also its sort of subtitle, um, When Blackness Enters the Frame. Um, and maybe I won't once sort of utter the word prison on stage because I think it is also um, a type of frame. Um, and I'm interested in us kind of like uh, talking about that um, very in-depthly. Um, and frames are sort of things or strategies that I think about constantly in my own work um, and in relationship to an art context. Um, so here and in general, um, our work sort of shares this interest in humanity versus or sort of in tandem with commodity and or objecthood. Um, so again, I'm going to paint a couple of pictures here to begin um, to think about how language, visible and invisible, begins to sort of structure the narratives that we live by. Um, so this slide uh, particularly um, depicts an installation shot from a recent show that I've had. Um, so the dominant piece in the foreground um, is a six-channel synchronized video with sound, which includes a custom tiled floor um, and a Benjamin Moore paint titled Timid White. So Timid White is a container for the piece. Um, the video itself is actually a 17 second loop of actress Julie Haggerty reciting a line from Spike Lee's film Clockers. Um, so this was performed as like the clip is what I'm talking about. The clip was actually, um, the clip that I took was performed as a comedic bit on a Cohen O'Brien show back in 1994, which is when the film sort of debuted. Um, so Haggerty recites, did I ever tell you the first time I killed somebody? And as she pronounces the words, laughter erupts from the audience. She sighs, she sticks out her tongue, licks her lips and rocks her head back and forth. Um, so this image of Haggerty is juxtaposed with the words of the fictional Rodney Little, who's an African-American man and drug dealer in the film. So one of the questions that I'm interested in here is how does the swapping of this language from one mouth to another immediately de-escalate the impact of its violence, sort of shape-shifting it into entertainment by O'Brien and Haggerty's design? So what happens when blackness enters the frame or is performed inside of a frame? Likewise, um, tucked away to the far left, which is sort of not visible here, but I was um, at least interested in um, sort of illustrating the proximity between the artworks in the show. So, in the left corner, there's a thing that's framed that you can kind of make out, it's blurred. Um, so this is a 60 by 50 inch painting. Um, the printed text in ink on the bottom of the painting reads, draw your own picture. Um, and then the handwritten text um, of the painting reads, to the white lady in Santa Fe who told me she squeezes her white granddaughter's hand every time she sees a big scary black man. Then she squeezes my hand because she's compelled to touch me and tells me about volunteering with the kids in Harlem. Fuck you, love and mercy, the misgendered artist. 
So this is a white page, sorry, yeah, so this is a white page holding a narrative of a white lady surrounded by an antique white paint and white out or corrective fluid. So in a section titled Selling Blackness um, from Simone's book, uh, she describes an early project by Keith and Mindy Obidike, um, Blackness for Sales, the title of the piece from 2001. Um, so Keith Obadike auctions his blackness on eBay. The auction lasted only 10 days, as surprisingly to me at least, it was deemed inappropriate by eBay, um, which I think is also incredibly fascinating to kind of think about. Um, but so in the, in the listing, there was no picture um, or no image of Keith. There was just a description of the item which reads, which read, and the font on the image is a little tiny, so I'm gonna kind of hold this up to my face. Um, so forgive me. Um, this heirloom has been in the possession of the seller for 28 years. Mr. Obadike's blackness has been used primarily in the United States, and its functionality outside of the U.S. cannot be guaranteed. Buyer will receive a certificate of authenticity. Interesting. I added interesting. Um, benefits and warnings. Benefit one. This blackness may be used for creating black art, too. This blackness may be used for writing critical essays or scholarship about other blacks, three. This blackness may be used for making jokes about black people and or laughing at black humor comfortably. Option three may overlap with option two. Four, this blackness may be used for assessing some affirmative action benefits. Limited time offer may already be pro prohibited in some areas. Five. This blackness may be used for dating a black person without fear of public scrutiny. Six, this blackness may be used for gaining access to exclusive high-risk neighborhoods. Seven, this blackness may be used for securing the right to use the term sister, brother, or nigga in reference to black people. Be sure to have certificate of authenticity on hand when using option seven. <laughs> Eight, this blackness may be used for instilling fear. Nine, this blackness may be used to uh oh, sorry. Augment uh, the blackness of others already black, especially for purposes of playing blacker than thou. 10, this blackness may be used by blacks as a spare in case your original blackness is whooped off. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> warning, and I'll go through just a couple of the warnings um, because I'm sure also we can imagine all of them. Um, one, the seller does not recommend that this blackness be used during legal proceedings of any sort. The seller does not recommend that this blackness be used seek while seeking employment. The seller does not recommend that this blackness be used um, in the process of making or selling serious art. The seller does not recommend that this blackness be used while shopping or writing a personal check. The seller does not recommend that this blackness be used while voting in the United States or Florida, an interesting distinction. <laughs> the seller does not rec recommend that this blackness be used while demanding fairness or demanding, periodly. Um, the seller does not recommend that this blackness be used in Hollywood. And then the seller does not recommend that this blackness be used for whites looking for a wild weekend. So there are um, a couple of things that I'm thinking about in relationship to these examples. First is the imaging of bodies and particularly black bodies. Um, and then to sort of uh, pull again another example to also kind of like paint the richness of the things that are sort of um, talked about and the nuances that sort of um, are woven throughout this book. Um, the last example that uh, Simone sort of writes about, which is in the epilogue, um, is this sort of YouTube video that went viral titled HP, HP Computers Are Racist. So in this example, um, to, to sort of reduce the label of the, the, the two people who are sort of participating, there are two characters, um, White Wanda and Black Desi. Um, so in front of the computer's webcam, Black Desi states, I think my blackness is um, interfering with the computer's ability to follow me, referring to the webcam's apparent inability to pan, tilt, zoom, follow, or detect um, any of Black Desi's gestures while well, alternatively being um, able to pick up all of White Wanda's moves. So I think the, the video maybe got somewhat over three million hits and comments. Um, so of course Hewitt Packer had to um, respond. Um, and so they first thanked 
uh, Black Desi and White Wanda for this video that they made and sort of pointing to this issue, um, but responded that, um, that it wasn't that the computers were sort of racist, but that the technology, this is a quote, um, the technology was built on standard algorithms. I was having a conversation with someone from uh, Marquette the other night about standard algorithms. Um, uh, was built on st standard algorithms that measure the difference in intensity of contrast between the eyes and the upper cheek and nose, and that the camera might have difficulty seeing contrast in conditions where there is insufficient foreground lighting. So on the one hand, there's a failure to capture. Um, there is also an erasure. There's a trying on and a sort of always unstable state in which blackness might exist. And what does this sort of uh, subtle language encoding do to reify or diminish these modes? What happens when a body cannot be captured or the rendering of its image refused? Or as, to kind of close it out, Fred Moten, thinking about Sadia Hartman, has um, articulated, at issue here is the precariousness of empathy in the uncertain line between witness and spectator. Only more obscene than the brutality unleashed at the whipping post is the demand that the suffering be materialized in evidence by the display of the tortured body or endless recitations of the ghastly and terrible. In light of this, how does one give expression to those outrages without exasperating the indifference to suffering that is the consequence of the bemoaning spectacle or contend with the narcissistic identification that obliterates the other or the prurience that too often is the response to such displays? So how do we picture violence? How can new narratives and images exist outside of the commodifying framework of surveillance? These, I think, are a couple of sort of nuanced examples to sort of fold back into um, the sort of Sylvia Winter text and thinking about this idea of um, no humans being involved um, and sort of all the ways that I'm personally thinking about image and language in my own personal work. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Oh, bad. Standing at around 14 feet high and 12 feet across, Sable Lee Smith's Swear It Closed closes it, I think, is symbolic of the prison's visiting room. It can mark the threshold between inside and out, if only these simple kinds of distinctions can be made in a carceral space that in the carceral spaces that mark, make, and, and subtend our current governing order. Swear it closed, closes it, marks the space of the bodily pat-downs and searches. It seems cold, heavy even. Like the modular metal tables with their built-in stools found in visiting rooms, bolted together, efficient and durable, but not meant to be comfortable or comforting. Part of the market in prison-grade furniture, sometimes called visitation station furniture and correctional facility furniture, or as one company that traffics in these objects put it, justice furniture. Swear it closed, closes it, is composed of powder-coated aluminum. Some parts are somewhat cobalt blue looking. Aluminum is said to be a soft metal. With one twelfth of the Earth's crust being aluminum, it is the third most common element after oxygen um, and silicone for the Earth's crust. In a discussion of when metal meets terror, but one of a different object, philosopher Gagua Chameyos suggests that to truly understand it, we must start by taking apart the mechanisms of violence. This is instructive, and this is what I think Sable Lee Smith's piece does. Chameyos says, go and look at the weapons, study their specific characteristics, for the aim here is an understanding that is not so much technical as political, he says. What is important, he cautions us, is not so much to grasp how the actual device works or to wonder whether the end justifies the means, but instead to interrogate what the choice of those means in itself tend to impose. Swear it closed, closes it, makes for an imposing archway, the passageway through which seems hardly welcoming. But for the artist, it gives us a way to understand the quotidian the ways that violence is made ordinary. In an interview with Kat Hartman in Cultured Magazine, Sable Lee Smith had this to say, if you hear the word violence, you think about the images that proliferate in the media. 
I'm not pointing to that kind of imagery or narrative. What I'm most concerned are with are invisible, quotidian, day-to-day -day type violence and what is the accumulation of those small, minuscule transgressions in the body over time. These minuscule transgressions here speak to the slow motion, stake sanctioned death that is life in captivity. The day-to-day -day violence of prolonged isolation, constant exposure to artificial light with its continuous hums, inspection, corporeal violence of the uniform prison guards. The slow motion death of incarceration uh, is for, for, for those that Sylvia Winter, whose 1992 open letter to her colleagues is from which this panel took its name today, states are subject to the status of the narratively condemned. Last year I began thinking with challenging, the challenging e-carceration projects. A group of researchers, uh, some activists, some policy makers, some university affiliated researchers, some formula, formularly incarcerated people, now researchers, and some a combination of all of these. I started to work with them or think with them to think through the work needed to create a broad rejection of electronic monitoring by way of ankle bracelets or other forms of shackles. Rather than seeing electronic monitoring as an alternative to incarceration and an effective means of post-incarceration supervision for people on parole or supervised release, the position of challenging incarceration project is that these technologies are a means of carceral expansion into people's homes and neighborhoods that sets dehumanizing limits on their freedom and as such should be abolished. A report released last month by Challenging E-Carceration and the Center for Media Justice, this is no, prison, no Digital Prisons campaign, entitled No More Shackles, Why We Must End the Use of Electronic Monitoring for People on Parole, and authored by James Kilgore, Emmett Sanders, and Maisha Haynes, found that electronic monitoring hinders the success of people subjected to it when, for example, jobs like house cleaning, landscaping, construction and delivery all pose challenge uh, for tracking a person's location, uh, such as, as such these types of employments are often not allowed. Or when concrete buildings uh, challenge tracking, uh, uh, sorry, when concrete buildings such as warehouses interfere with the GPS signal or the GPS monitor, forcing people to leave work and go outside to pick up a signal on their phone uh, in order to phone into their parole officers, thus creating tensions with employers. Or when call center operators are slow to pick up the phone or neglect to record permissions granted for movement. So while Martha Stewart was subjected to, it, to electronic monitoring, I guess, she was still able to move about her vast estate. Um, same for Paul Manafort when he was on home confinement and monitored by GPS. But for most others on, on house arrest, short perimeters make tasks like picking up children from the school bus stop or emptying garbage or going outside for a cigarette a potential violation of the rules of supervision. The shackles are also not cost effective, and for those that are already financially vulnerable, paying rent for electronic monitoring devices and the cost of having the necessary landline phone are often untenable. On our call last month, one person spoke of being forced to pay over $275 a month um, for monetary costs associated with the device, with no end in sight. With Sable Lee Smith's call that we must be concerned with the invisible, quotidian, day-to-day -day type of violence, um, I now turn to, sorry, uh, we could look again to the, um, the No Digital Prisons reports calls for, uh, that calls for resources and technology should be put into creating post-incarceration opportunities rather than increasing electronic monitoring's capacity as a surveillance a device by linking it to biometric technology or electronic, uh, or, or the, the idea that these electronic monitoring devices can be used to gentrify spaces by way of electronic leash, just uh, pointing out where people can and cannot go. One so-called solution um, that is sometimes offered up instead of, of, of these shackles is a mobile phone, the thinking being everyone, quote unquote, has a mobile phone anyway. But video-enabled cell phones that could be used by state surveillance and policing agencies to demand verification by way of facial recognition would also lead to the massifying of data that could be held by private vendors um, who monitor these devices. Over the last 40 years or so, the number of people on probation and parole has quadrupled. 
Anticipating what uh, abolition, dismantling, and decarceration needs to look like for thriving communities, I think, requires an arts and research that is undertaken with those communities, asking how an object like electronic monitoring impacts the lives they want to lead. For me and many others, it's a question of social imaginaries that are attuned to the specificities of place, people, and objects. Uh, thank you. Sable, I was really struck by how you framed both your interests and Simone interests, Simone's interests in relation to these three words, humanity, commodity, and objecthood. Mm -hmm. And in light of Sylvia Winter's essay, No Humans Involved, I'm wondering if maybe both of you could think out loud a little bit around some of the, um, the how the word human or how the word humanity might be helpful and harmful as this kind of big category bucket that we tend to call upon, right? Like human rights, um, social justice tends to turn to that. But maybe we could think a little bit about how both of you in your own work problematize that term or what are some of the like trickinesses that are, exist in that, in that vocabulary. <laughs> Just a light question. Yeah, it is, yeah, it exactly. sounds like a light question. <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe since we're thinking out loud, yes. um, I can sort of start. Um, I don't know. I guess the kind of um, the, the, the impetus for some of the ways that I approach making work about prison industrial complex violence um, is always sort of centering um, and focusing on uh, humanity, um, and I don't think, I mean, I think it's an interesting question to sort of think about, like ringing, to think about the, uh, the, like, the sort of issues and potential um, um, uh, positives in using the word humanity, um, but I, I, I guess the, I'm always sort of struck by the, 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 the issue that like, right, the, um, some of the ways that the system is allowed to sort of build and perpetuate is because there is a foreclosure of humanity for certain subjectivities. Um, and so for me, and I also see like, I'm involved in a lot of different types of sort of prison work and conversations. Um, and so I always see that there's like a conversation about statistics, there's a conversation about policy, but there is never a conversation about the humanity of individuals or individuals who sort of, um, um, kind of grouped into larger conversations that are important, but like thinking about statistics or thinking about a kind of like large general, generalization of talking about like a swath of a community. Um, and so for me, it's, it has always been important that like individuals, so individual narratives um, and um, thinking about one's own kind of uh, um, like the, the fact that like imagination can exist in certain, certain spaces and the, the way that uh, the system is kind of functioning to sort of uh, foreclose one's humanity and therefore render them an object or render them a commodity if we're talking about prison in relationship to its sort of economic function or if we're talking about it in relationship to the violation of human rights function. Um, so um, because it's not a kind of like uh, I guess demanded position that I find in every single one of those conversations, even productive conversations of people who are doing good work, it felt important that it's a, it, it was a space for me to intervene mm -hmm. um, and always intervene and always work from that position um, because, yeah, again, because it's the position that's not stated. And I think that it is a part of like, um, I mean, I think that part of um, um, what Elizabeth was sort of talking about in her keynote last night was, um, like trying to, or I guess asking us to sort of talk about the kind of like racist ideologies that exist in the country outside of just like thinking about policy or thinking about better policing and like looking at those side by side. Um, and so for me, a part of the project is like, okay, here's this narrative that I don't see happening and we can need to talk about or think about this in relationship to all the other narratives or conversations that's happening. Um, 
And that's why language becomes important, I think, to my practice. Mm -hmm. I like that idea of, like, of, of, of what goes missing sometimes mm -hmm. in the work and how you make that intervention and always putting um, the human uh, to, the, to the forefront. And for me, I, I often look at objects and technologies that, that work in the practice of dehumanization. So the, mm -hmm. it's like the subtext, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's there. Um, and, and, I, and you mentioned like my work on light, like mm -hmm. something that is just uh, seemingly a Oculus could be this used as a uh, technology of violence, it. and so um, the idea that um, sorry, <laughs> the sign there was like, <laughs> um, oh. yeah. <laughs> And so, so looking at something as simple as a lantern yeah. uh, that could be used to uh, monitor as, as a kind of supervisory device, um, the idea of, uh, of of people looking all too human mm -hmm. um, and in need of these types of uh, the system requiring these types of uh, regulations. Um, one thing for me is uh, you, you gave an interview uh, where you talked about I, I, what I imagine is the same space of the of the of the piece that I discussed, mm -hmm. um, where you said the visitation area feels sacred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, those are those moments when even the, 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 the metal steel structure, the kind of security theater that, that I could mm -hmm. imagine mm -hmm. goes through, the taking off of your shoes, mm -hmm. your belts, mm -hmm. the, um, what uh, Angela Davis calls the state sanctioned mm -hmm. strip search mm -hmm. that happens in those spaces. Mm -hmm. But there are still spaces of, of, it is still a space for many of community making, of, mm -hmm. of family making. And so in that sense, the, the idea of the sacred mm -hmm. um, comes through even when surrounded by these technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and so I like the idea of that coming out. And, mm -hmm. it, and for, for me, it's the documents. It's like, how do you look at the historical documents um, of, for example, a slave ship schematic mm -hmm. and map that onto the prison system schematics? Mm -hmm. But they're all, but through the artists, I feel, is where that work comes through of the sacred mm -hmm. um, and what, and what could be made possible in, mm -hmm. in these space. And, mm -hmm. it's, and, and to bring a structure like that into a museum space um, allows those of us and those who might not go through those spaces or might be involved in the making of the technology of those spaces, mm -hmm. like those, I, I was on Pinterest where I got those names of like justice furniture mm -hmm. and these like the, a Pinterest list on justice <laughs> exactly. furniture yeah. or quote yeah. unquote, you know. Yeah. But, that, but the idea that, that, that art brings that, those conversations into various spaces where they might not necessarily, and then we can rethink, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily see these spaces as sacred, but like that they need to be spaces of like recognizing people's humanity mm -hmm. uh, in, in positions of captivity. Yeah, absolutely. I think also like, um, yeah, that like that sacred or those kind of like sort of moments of intimacy or mm. like familial exchange and also the idea of love, right, mm. existing in those spaces. Mm -hmm. I made a work um, that was super simple, uh, like a metal sort of board and like uh, like a, what do you call it? Um, a changeable letter board with plastic letters and it says my father was a drug dealer and loved me. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the types of conversations that happen around a work like that and just like the, the fact that it becomes this kind of like aha epiphany moment for someone to think that uh, or to sort of reckon with their own kind of like ideology that, oh yes, an incarcerated person can be a father, can love, right? Yeah. And so like if this is not a part of the conversation of how we're thinking about uh, dealing with uh, bodies that need to sort of, ex bodies who exist in these spaces or what an alternative can be, then like what, like how, how are you actually kind of like considering or distancing um, what you then allow yourself to think, project, and then do, and then uh, sort of be coerced into sort of agreeing with for certain subgroups of people. Yeah, this, I mean, both of you are making me think about the sensorial and, mm -hmm. you know, like this idea of bodily training, the way that um, walking through the threshold, right, of the arc that's at the Haggerty, you can't help but feel kind of overwhelmed by the scale. Like you feel like you feel so tiny in relation to this giant thing, like your world's turned upside down and it brings, it sheds into light like all these other kinds of bodily ways that we're um, overwhelmed by surveillance technologies or like the diffusion of policing techniques, right? So that take, you know, having a cigarette break becomes um, something that you have to think three or four times about um, and you, it's a risk that mm -hmm. you take on, right? And um, in Sable, your work, I'm, I'm always kind of taken aback by how s something like reading a text, you feel it in your body. Mm -hmm. um, it's very visceral. And so I'm, I'm wondering if both of you can talk a little bit out loud around like 
how these things are entangled, right? There's like a pain and a pleasure in these, in these bodily trainings. And there's something about calling attention to them that, um, that moves us further into the problem, mm -hmm. right? Like how an act of walking or how an act of puffing on a cigarette becomes all of a sudden um, enlarged and enhanced by these threats of, of violence, um, but also of, like pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's not really a question, but you know, you're, you're prompting me to think about thinking about the relationship between like the visible, the things that we see that are like spectacular or that we can easily identify as part of a state system of governance, and then these like these things that are that are more imperceptible, that are more affective, and how you think those things might work together, um, yeah, or what the potential is, right, in calling attention to the bodily, like mm -hmm. what might that do for us in a different vector than just like policy change or administrative change, right? Like, what is calling attention to that do? Mm -hmm. mm. That, that, that's another one of your good questions that are quite <laughs> complex to break down. But it has me um, thinking of, like, the, when, you, when you talked about this idea of someone going outside, and those someones are differently gendered and differently wa uh, raced, and, and, and very other, uh, other categories of determination, which mm -hmm. determinations how, determine, sorry, how they are seen by some. Mm -hmm. And you can think of all of the recent um, uh, things where you, where you see the, these kind of cutesy names for really articulations of state violence, mm -hmm. of like permit patty, mm -hmm. or someone mm -hmm. being asked to like leave a dorm room that they're mm -hmm. sleeping, mm -hmm. or selling, you know, selling uh, girl guy cookies, getting marked as mm -hmm. a kind of like mm -hmm. a criminal activity or so. And so I, I think those moments um, are important also to question uh, our own situatedness and how, um, I guess, policing is instrumentalized um, to, uh, to render others, to render people subject to death or killable or other types of violent kind of um, interactions. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, it's always, um, again, a part of the sort of project is, uh, it's important to, for me to, always privilege bodily knowledge as opposed to intellectual knowledge. And that doesn't mean that they both don't sort of exist in the work. They do on a number of sort of levels. And I think that we've kind of had conversations about this, like thinking about uh, the way that my work is sort of written about or the press receives the work, right? Like always um, focusing on the like subject matter or the content or the kind of like biographical narrative as opposed to the my intellectual weight that might also be happening in an object. Um, but personally the kind of like bodily knowledge is important to me because um, I think that um, a, a type of understanding has to be situated in uh, multiple types of bodies and particularly uh, the body of the dominant subjectivity that doesn't have to think about their body daily right um, and it's like it's easy to distance um, oneself from a, a subject intellectually, um, but when there is a different type of knowledge that sort of registers bodily, I think that makes it more difficult, and then you're able to then recognize or sort of empathize with the humanity of an other narrative, subjectivity, whatever. Um, and, that, and that's the type of knowledge that doesn't leave. Um, and that's the type of thing that like one has to continuously type uh, continuously wrestle with, um, and it might be slow, but I think it is like that that the accumulation of that type of knowledge in relationship to the intellectual that does like a different type of work. Um, and I mean, I uh, there's like a kind of I guess ongoing argument um, that I get into all the time when thinking about like um, I don't know how can we enact change or like what is the kind of possibility to in enact a certain type of change. Um, and the thing that it's sort of at stake, um, I personally think, is that certain people don't have to put their bodies on the line, where certain people's bodies are always on the line. And so when your body is not threatened, but your comfort is threatened, mm. you always have the, the possibility to walk away, right? Because it means putting your body on the line to change something. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have an understanding of that, or if you haven't been made to feel that, then like, where, where is the kind of friction that, pour, that sort of uh, propels someone to move a little bit further? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why it's like incredibly important to me, because then it, again, uh, it, it, I guess it obviously sort of comes back to this idea of humanity, but like it, in case you couldn't see this uh, subjectivity as human, then now that you have this bodily experience that you're connecting with the affect of what's happening um, or, con or connecting with like the pain or the pleasure or any kind of like um, 
um, um, um, emotion that might uh, that the thing or the object might be facilitating, then you're connecting yourself with the sort of I subject position that it might be talking about. And then you're, you're, you're confronted with your desire to either walk away, reject it, or look away. But it's not just like looking at a text or a statistic and like walking away. It's like you're, you acknowledge that you're making a decision to walk away now. And there's that small wrestling that feels important to me. It feels like it does a different type of work. Yeah, it makes me think about how, you know, the, in, in Sylvia Winter's title, No Humans Involved, like the kind of subplot of that essay is that like, well, if no humans are involved, right, if like black men are considered to be not the no humans there, so too are the, so too are the people initiating the violence, mm -hmm. so too are the police, right, they're inhuman to, to like a violating degree, mm -hmm. and that, you know, this kind of idea of like wrestling with what, what relationship to human are you going to have mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. is key there. Do you all have questions for each other before we open it up? Um. <laughs> not to put any pressure on you, you've done a lot of work today. Do you have any questions? <laughs> well, what was why, why the name of that of the structure? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't that I was sort of wrestling back and forth with for a while, um, and it is uh, a kind of like excerpt from the title. No, not the title. Uh, a line of a um, small white poem mm -hmm. um, from her collection um, on being dispersed, mm -hmm. um, which is like a beautiful kind of um, collection of poetry that I think is like really interested and important because she's like really toying with um, and exploring language in a very particularly fresh way and actually creating new language. Um, and there's been like a number of kind of like interviews and reviews of that work where um, people are always commenting that she's sort of talking or like it's apparent that she's talking about a type of black experience. But outside of all the kind of like um, uh, stereotypical or sort of superficial ways that we expect black experience to be sort of articulated um, and, you, and really creating a kind of like new language around that, um, which um, is a kind of, I don't know, refreshing encounter, um, but also a kind of um, 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 like a challenging encounter to kind of like wrestle through the dens density of the language. Um, and so the line, this is like a long winded way to get, the, get to it, but the line is um, uh, Punisher, uh, swear it close closes it um, and I was thinking or, or my own kind of like um, I guess neurotic uh, process like going back and forth with the idea of like including Punisher or not and if it becomes sort of um, overdetermined um, and um, that kind of like swear it close closes it so like the kind of um, I guess the multiplicity of like the way that all every single definition of every word in that kind of like phrase could be sort of um, um, interpreted. So mm -hmm. to swear as to curse or to swear um, in like a number of different ways, but like um, thinking about uh, it also having this kind of like a cyclical, um, um, I guess, potential of closing or not closed, or if it is closed, and where is the past tense or the present or the future, mm -hmm. um, and the arch sort of working as this simultaneity also. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was kind of thinking about. Yeah, and, and then the swear as a promise, mm -hmm. and, as, mm -hmm. uh, a, a, and, and mm -hmm. what the art can promise mm -hmm. to do, mm -hmm. uh, I think is, there was an, another text by Winter called, uh, Sylvia Winter called Rethinking Aesthetics, mm -hmm. Notes on a Deciphering Practice, mm -hmm. and when she asks us to think of of, of art and creative text, and she's looking particularly at film, mm -hmm. and I think we could broaden it to think of other things. It's the idea, uh, to, to have a deciphering practice is mm -hmm. not what to, to see what they are signified to mean, but what they can do, mm -hmm. and what the art uh, can do. Mm -hmm. And particularly from that status of the narratively condemned that she discusses in, um, in the No Humans Involved um, essay, or, 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 uh, or the other ways in which many of us are caught up in, in a system of, um, I guess, deniability of rights or, or, or deniability or to deny people there into the category of human, but to like look at art as the space where it can be put into the work to do things, mm -hmm. to change things. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the friction that mm -hmm. you were talking mm -hmm. about or the possibilities mm -hmm. that would just maybe not allow you to turn away, but allow you mm -hmm. to turn, if, you're, if you choose to turn away, you're turning away with that knowledge, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of, of your own complicity in doing so. Yeah. I think we have some time for questions from the audience. Oh, yes, there's one right here in the middle. Oh, we need a minute for the mic.
another light it's question. Well, it, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great question because in my work I'm in, in increasingly trying to be aware of using the word body. Mm -hmm. Particularly, there's a kind of currency in which people often use uh, the like the phrase the black body to talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. the black body, but we don't say the white body because that's mm -hmm. a norm that's already established mm -hmm. as already human and gendered in a particular way. And so for me, I I, I do uh, try to. Uh, to just be aware and always use people because that that is um, a, a continuing recognition of our shared humanity. Whereas body is something that is acted upon; it's an, it's objectifying, but also an object, um, in, in object making in, in that. So, and I do I I'm, I hear you on this ways in which uh, academic language or a certain shorthand that often is necessary to, to discuss complex situations, but often uh, it pushes many people continually to the margin and, and excludes convert people from having conversations um, and so I, 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 I hear you on that yeah for sure yeah I think when um, in thinking about like uh, the the kind of kind of uh, the kind of concerns that I have in um, the art practice also in the I guess some of the writing that I do um, I um, emphasize and kind of focus on uh, the word body because I'm talking about like affect um, mm -hmm. and thinking about like how you feel things literally inside of your body as, as, as opposed to inside of like people, right? Um, and so the, in, in the way that I kind of employ the term, it is, I guess, outside of a kind of like academic framework, right? Like in that sense, I'm thinking about, um, thinking about affect, thinking about emotion, thinking about actual kind of like uh, physicality. Um, and so using that specifically to think about how these things sort of register and are located inside of ourselves. Body as material. Yep. Great question. Uh, thank, thanks a lot uh, for an awesome uh, body of thoughts. I just use the word body. Um, I have a question sort of in the other direction, more towards like in order to make it as an artist nowadays, always already have to have a PhD. Um, you, I'm just curious as to why no humans involved, or you, the relationship between your work and theory, um, but why no humans involved as a platform for this discussion, as opposed to you know any number of other texts by Wonder or uh, other authors? Yeah, that's for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, the thing that, um, yeah, I don't know. There's like a, I think that, wow, there are moments where uh, Sylvia Winter's text, No Humans Involved, gets dense. I think that the thing that um, was really sort of exciting and striking and also a thing that I constantly come back to is the kind of like open letter. Um, and the fact that it is a like it is a really sort of practical didactic example like she's pulling LAPD documents um, and exposing them and using that as a, a, a platform to then think about this other kind of like theoretical framework so she's talking about like the LAPD um, in their uh, I guess what do you call them reports um, when they arrest someone or when they cause bodily harm to a certain uh, type of person or body, they write no humans involved as if it is okay and dismisses it. Um, and I think that's interesting, especially in relationship to the conversation or a couple of the comments that uh, Elizabeth Hinton said last night about her book being based on like, um, or it coming to fruition um, because she had access to certain governmental documents, right? To sort of trace history and trace policy. Um, and so the, the kind of, I, there, there are a couple of reasons why the Sylvia um, Winter text was interesting. And not just because of Sylvia Winter, because of the fact that the LAPD like, had a certain type of entitlement and thought it was okay to, in an official document, render people not human and write it down and know that this practice is inhumane, illegal, and all sorts of other things, but be okay and have the authority and the power to document it and then save it, right? Like that's the thing that is sort of fascinating. Um, and that's the thing that I also wanted to sort of call attention to because it's like, it's not the type of example that we talk about or a type of information that we, um, um, that becomes a part of a number of the conversations that we're having, right? The fact that there is a, a, a sanctioned space where this could be 
media document, and a number of um, supervisors uh, can see this, sign off on it, and say, okay, go ha file that under F. What I like about, and I wish I had a copy, my copy of it right here to just quote the, the end of it, because mm -hmm. what she's doing is she's imploring her colleagues that we have work to do, mm -hmm. and, we're, and, and she's speaking at you know, this University of uh, California at Berkeley, but she's ending it with like a quote from uh, Franz Fanon saying that the knowledge is mm -hmm. already there, the mm -hmm. work is already being done by those that are said to be narratively condemned, the dispossessed, the, um, the, the, the dame de terre, and a, and a few other um, terminologies to mark a certain category of like the, the, the intellectual and the theoretical mm -hmm. work is already being done by those people. So we are missing out in, um, in collaborating with that knowledge mm -hmm. production in the creation of something new. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it, it's that she's, while the LAPD might be rendering people into this category of non-human, she, she's, as we know, people are already in, uh, in that human, making human works and human movements and creating a better life, mm -hmm. at, at least attempting to. And that's what she's uh, addressing mm -hmm. at, at that moment, I think. And that's why I think the essay, the, as an open letter form, is so mm -hmm. um, uh, instructive and valuable. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a call. Completely. That's a great question. Yeah, there's one there. Um, and then we can go up here. After. Uh, first, thanks so much for this really important work. Uh, and thanks also for coming to Milwaukee, a community that could be a very dangerous place for people that look like you. Uh, here's my question. Um, your work, the work of others, have, has helped a lot of us come to a deeper understanding of the prison industrial complex. Uh, there's another complex that we're less familiar with, of the nonprofit industrial complex. Uh, that sense that the nonprofit sector uh, functions as a vast system of social control instead of a force for systems change. Uh, so my question is, are there artists that are working to uh, shine a light on the nonprofit industrial complex? And uh, if you can tell us about that work, uh, if it's not happening, uh, would you please do it? <laughs> Sam. Oh, is this the this is the question for the art, art historian. historian. <laughs> um, that's a great question. The first person that comes to mind for me is Cameron Rowland, um, who, if you're not familiar with, with his work, um, I'm thinking of Attica's, Attica series desk, mm -hmm. uh, which is, oh, I, that's the only piece I can think of at this moment, because um, I'm a bad art historian. <laughs> but um, that, that piece is, he, he basically um, exhibits a desk that's made by Corecroft Industries, by prisoners in Attica, um, without any wall text or gallery text, just in, or in the middle of a gallery. And uh, that piece calls attention to how entangled these various kinds of institutions are, because Corecroft only sells to um, state, you know, um, I don't know, to the state, to, to public schools, but also they have like a little qualifier, or to certain nonprofit organizations. And so, you know, that, that his work is often modeled in this thing of institutional critique, it's kind of fancy terminology. I think the way that it really, um, what it signposts is the ways that like, how sitting at a desk, right, can implicate you. Like how many people in here have sat at a desk ever? <laughs> Everyone. You no, know, that's like a real question in the room, right? Like we can all raise our hands. So like what, where was that desk made? How is it made? Who makes it? What kind of labor is done? And you know, not to like, and he doesn't, and I don't think he does, but it, you know, not to spectacularize um, the labor that happens by people inside. I, I think he does this in a way that really calls attention to how these institutions are implicated, right? Like a nonprofit working for education reform might have bought this desk mm -hmm. unknowingly um, made made by people making zero money for it, right? Um, he's, he's somebody that I think does this. I don't do nonprofits. I mean, I think that's a great example. Institutional critique. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you're critiquing the museum. 
Yeah. Or actually, that reminds me, um, Andrea Frazier, yes. who was someone I was going to bring up. I had a number of questions last night, but I didn't bring any of them up. But Andrea Frazier recently published a book called 2016, um, what, Money, Politics, and Museums. Museums, Money, and Politics. I don't have the order correct. Um, but basically, it's uh, it, like conceptually kind of like uh, references a telephone book, so Yellow Pages, old school. Um, and she... Uh, selects a museum or at least one museum in all of the 50 states, um, researches their board of trustees, I think specifically, um, and uh, also researches their, their uh, um, financial political contributions and how much in their financial contributions to the museum and lines up the politics of the, or the, the implication is that you line up the politics of the mission of the museum and the politics of the people giving the money to support it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a lot there that answers your question, mm -hmm. or that could speak to your question. Mm -hmm. There was a question right here. Yeah. Oh, sure. Great. Okay, mm -hmm. that's very kind. Do you want to? Sure. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, um, just between last night and this morning, is the sort of um, layered relationship between visibility and conversations and a lot of that has been at the level of structures, whether it's surveillance or it's big systematic systems um, of organization. Um, but Sable, there's a piece that you have in the Haggerty um, that I think gets at um, this sort of very human level of um, that question of visibility and invisibility. And it's the one with the paragraph of black text on that white wall and it's a sort of contemplative rumination about a speaker that it concludes with the speaker thinking about the choice of photographic images to bring or not bring. And I would actually just love to hear you talk about that piece a little bit and what, what you're thinking behind it. And um, that, I found that very poignant, that, that mm -hmm. just that connection of like that moment of deciding what images that one wants to keep close. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so the the piece that they're talking about um, is uh, these sort of one inch uh, black letters cut out of plexi that are probably like a half an inch thick and are individual letters that are placed on the wall. So it's also a kind of like painstaking uh, labor to install the language on the wall. Um, and I can't remember it sort of verbatim, but the, the text basically says that um, it sort of opens with a declaration of enjoying um, reading letters. Um, and then it um, sort of uh, categorizes the objects that one can take um, inside of the prison visiting room when going to visit someone. So um, it says you can take uh, two $10 roll of quarters, um, 20 singles, you have to take a transparent bag, five, mat or five, cigarette five loose cigarettes, a book of matches, I think 10 photographs, um, one a single key, an ID. Um, and a couple of other sort of objects that it mentions. Um, and then at the end, as it sort of uh, just like indexes all these items that, you're, that are allowed, and it says these are the only items that can pass through, as it indexes these items, um, it sort of uh, ends with a, a number of uh, five by seven photographs that you can take in, and it asks you, uh, or then it asks a question, how do you choose which pictures? Um, also, I think it's interesting because like, um, or something that is interesting to me about this whole process and thinking about the idea of what you can sort of take in and what these objects sort of reference, what they, um, what they hint to, um, and what types of sort of false um, security they offer by just being able to take in one key as opposed to two keys and just the, the kind of like um, restrictions in the, the amount of uh, labor and sort of processes that one needs to go through. Uh, like intellectually and physically to then think about this sort of emotional labor to enter this space. Um, but also the format of the photographs, right? Like five or 10, I can't remember now off the top of my head, five by seven photographs, which is like, um, a, like a format that we also don't use exactly. in the contemporary, right? Like everything is digital. So even, even thinking about like how the technology, right? Like still uh, forces, um, um, extra steps um, and types of um, contemplation, right? To like choose a photograph, to then go mm -hmm. potentially get it print out. What is the cost of printing a format that no one uses anymore <laughs> to then get these things to take into a space? Mm -hmm. um, and then also when you take these photographs into that space, you can't leave them. So it's also this like, um, this like temporary kind of like ephemeral um, 
performance, um, but also genuine tr uh, type of connection. Um, and so I guess for me, it was important to one, make visible just that kind of like uh, processing um, and set of protocols and procedures that don't inherently um, like have an actual kind of uh, reason, right? Like there are reasons why certain things can't be taken into the visiting room, um, but like five pictures versus seven pictures, right? Like this one key, the five loose cigarettes, like you can't break out of prison with 10 loose cigarettes as opposed to five. Um, so the, the, like the, the moments where power is constantly kind of like uh, reified and implied, um, is a very important, and it gets to this like question, I guess, of the sort of quotidian or the kind of like ordinary violence, right? Like the limitations and the structures um, uh, create this kind of like emotional taxation um, that I think is incredibly important to think about and 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 highlight and privilege. Like it's important to kind of talk about a, a type of like cor uh, like uh, corporal sort of brutality that happens in a prison space, but it's also important to think about. Uh, one, have, one having to sit at home, pull out their pack of cigarettes and think about five versus 10, especially if you're going into a space that might be stressful for you and you need to smoke 12 cigarettes um, or any number of kind of things that has to happen. Um, and so again, because um, this is a space where um, like in a live visit, one can spend maybe six to eight hours, depending on what the institution is and geographically, right? So to try to create a, a sense of normalcy, to try to connect, to try to foster a, a, a space of intimacy um, and share a moment, right? To want to sort of share a photograph. How do you choose which ones for the six hours you're there uh, to be able to sort of share or reference something and also um, um, like uh, re-inspire someone's hope Right in a space where potentially, like depending on the circumstance, there might not be any hope. Right, like all of these become incredibly important um, and incredibly important to make visible and to be a part of the conversation, just as well as all the other sort of um, conversations that are happening. I'm kind of like going on a tangent now, but these are some of the things that um, are were important to me in thinking about uh, making that work, and also just the fact that it's a text piece where one has to slow down and read and think about it, right? And like to try to create some of that slowness, um, to try to suspend someone in a different moment of time to then think about time differently or think about doing time and all the other sort of constructs that are sort of wrapped up in it. Um, and then the, the, the piece is like semi-reflective. So then in moments you either catch the light or you catch yourself or you're distracted in it. Um, and all of those things were sort of important to me. Um. Thank you so much for your work, Sable. Um, I work with youth who are incarcerated in Virginia and the letterboard um, poems that you mentioned earlier like, blew their minds and we kind of did our own versions of them. But um, thank you again for presenting. Um, I was curious, uh, especially with the topic of this symposium uh, focusing on arts relationship to criminal justice reform, when you're working with museums, galleries, uh, which necessarily have like self-selecting audiences, um, how do you see or try to position your work? Um, not, not that those audiences don't deeply, not that all of us don't deeply need to grapple with these issues, um, but how do you get beyond those self-selecting audiences to truly impact and support criminal justice reform? I guess that's a me question again also. Um, that's a really good question, that's an important question. Um, because that also is a thing that I think um, it can be invisible in the work. Um, and it's a thing that like, um, I guess in the context of sort of conversations like this um, and any other kind of, I don't know, speaking engagement is a thing that I make visible because it's a part of um, my practice in a very specific type of way um, and we can like, talk about it in art terms, but we can also talk about it practically, right? Like for me to make an exhibition or to make a work um, that then will be in um, a museum space, um, there's a lot of kind of like invisible labor that I demand that the institution does. Um, and those are things that like one doesn't know when you walk into a space and like looks at a neon or something. Um, and I think that they're like, um, the kind of difference between what becomes visible and what's invisible is like an interesting question and it's the thing that like uh, the space of writing or the space of reviews or essays can kind of unfold and also the space of like speaking engagements or the n numerous groups that I sort of bring to a space. But I guess to kind of like um, 
condense it a little bit. Um, basically, um, I make very strict decisions about the, the ins where my work can be shown, like just in general, um, um, and in which context it can be shown. And then if I agree to participate in a thing, then there, all, there is always um, a kind of pedagogical or educational component that is incredibly important to me. Um, and so for institutions that are not um, academic museums, right, that don't already have that embedded in like um, any number of spaces, then um, I know that there's always a exhibition budget. Um, I know that the budgets that they might uh, present to me in the beginning are smaller than budgets that they might present to someone else, so I demand a larger budget. Um, and I sometimes demand that the labor that goes into an exhibition is uh, outsourced or given to people that I bring in and say, this is the type of person that needs to do this work, or this is the person that you should hire if you want me to do the thing. Um, also, I ask about the audience and I ask about programming. And if I'm to do programming, then I ask them to bring in uh, different types of groups because I have personal relationships with a number of types of, I mean, for a number of types of groups, specifically in New York City, but also in other spaces or other people I know who are doing the work that's important to me. And making sure that those people are able to come in and see the work and have an experience and have a rich experience. Or that, uh, I don't know, teens that I work with are then paid to be uh, tour guides or to teach from the exhibition, right? So that their voice is also present. Um, and so there are a number of kind of strategies and things that I go into a space and basically demand. Um, and I think that work is important because I think art is important for its own reason, um, but for me, it's not enough. Um, but that doesn't mean that, I guess, everything that I'm doing needs to be seen, but that I know that it's happening kind of like under the surface. Um, so that's always sort of a part of the larger kind of like package of how either me or my work is existing in the world. There was a question here, I think. Yeah. Oh, great, fantastic. Hi, is this on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, thank you, all three of you, for a really important conversation. Um, I'm actually really delighted to be here as an official respondent. So, to um, that, to my mind, that meant that I could officially take out my computer and type various <laughs> various notes, and I am probably going to draw from them in a little bit. But I wanted to thank um, all of you first, and also um, Sampada for the really important question that you started with, which I think that. Um, that both um, Simone and Sable deal in really complicated ways with in their work, which is the question of um, the problem of the question of a, an appeal to humanity. Um, so when we're talking about the context of, a, of racialized dehumanization, we're necessarily talking about the context in, of the um, very fabric, right, of, of the United States. And when we're talking about racialized dehumanization, we're necessarily what's put in front of us is this apparently first this project of rehumanizing. Right? But then when we do that and we stop there, we don't actually get to talk about what the problem with the notion of hu the humane and humanity actually is. And you all draw, and you referenced um, Hartman, um, Sable, in your work. Hartman's work points us to the problems with an appeal to humanity that's sort of based on and happens through this identification of the feeling self you know, feeling for an other suffering, namely within the context of abolish, the abolitionist movement. Um, when Rankin was trying to appeal to his would-be white counterparts, he wrote um, very um, effectively rhetorically in the vein of, imagine what it would feel if you were in the place of the slave and having your family torn from you. And it was only through the feeling of the self in the other's place that made it possible for people to move and to be incited to move. But what does it mean if we can't feel for the other unless we obliterate the other, right? So we, we know this work and we know that it's really important and that's one of, the, one of the things that we have to keep in mind. If we are only made to feel for ourselves and can only move when we feel for ourselves, what if an object in a museum doesn't make us recognize mm -hmm. ourselves in that? Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the issues that I sort of had yesterday mm -hmm. with um, where the conversation wasn't, wasn't go just for time, able to go just for time constraints. Um, but until we can understand that institutionalized caging, and I appreciate your suggestion that we find a way of not talking about prisons as prisons because we import so many logics that are simplifying when we do that because we think we know what we're saying when we say that word. Um, but until we can recognize that institutionalized caging doesn't work, it doesn't make anybody safe, even when the subjects who are caged are people who we can't necessarily feel for, then 
as, as long as we're invested in humanity and that project of humanity, we're, we're not going to understand what's wrong with the system. Yeah. Um, so innocent, innocent and exonerated subjects are those for whom we can feel readily, right? Mm -hmm. And this is something that I'm writing about in my own work. Until we can feel for those who actually commit mm -hmm. criminalized activity and recognize that the system that we're using to address that doesn't work, mm -hmm. then this system is going to continue, continue to, to do what it does. Um, much more to say, but I'm, I'm going to stop there. But this question of, of, of humanity, it's, it's not a simple one, and neither of you treat it simply in your work at all. Um, but it's, it's a difficult conversation to get into because if we're talking about dehumanization and rehumanization and we leave it there, then we're not getting at the nuances even of what you're doing or how, how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's a question here and then we can go to the back. Hi, thank y'all. Um, I had a quick question about how y'all think about art made within um, carceral contexts and how you conceptualize that or think about that. Is that for you? <laughs> um, do, I mean, this is an interesting question. I think a lot about San Quentin um, prison. I, I, I like subplot is I worked for Prison University Project for a couple years, so I've had the privilege of doing that. It's the only context I'm really familiar with. And, um, you know, I think, again, it's another one that's like, that is a little bit tricky, right? I think um, art that happens inside is so necessary for for a therapeutic process, for a creative expression, for imagining a different kind of possibility. And um, those contexts are really important. Those programs are really important. I think like, thinking about how that circulates outside and what kinds of stories that tells is people are doing really rich and dynamic um, projects around this that I, you know, I can't really even speak to with any kind of authority, but I, I do want to say one model, which is the Uruguayana Center for the Arts does a show um, every year called Bay Area Now that is like, that uh, draws from artists all around the Bay, and they've for years now um, included artists who are incarcerated, and um, that's kind of shifted the conversation a little bit in terms of these institutional spaces and how we think about how they're composed, and I think that's a really, um, they demonstrate an insightful pro problem to have, right? Like, what does it mean for an institution to be showing this work? And how, what are the other ways, what are the invisible ways that they might be contributing to, um, you know, either reinforcing the prison as the site, or could they be doing something to dismantle it as a, as a reality? I don't, that's not really speaking to your question, it's a big one, but I don't know if Sable or somebody have Yeah, I mean, there, it, it's an interesting question that can kind of go a number of ways, I think that, like, just like in a kind of practical sense. Ooh, is that me? I don't know. I'm just like leaning back. There's nothing to lean back from. But um, I think that it's important. Also, uh, separately, there's a professor and scholar named Nicole Fleetwood, who she works at Rutgers, who does a lot of work around this and does a lot of uh, um, organization of exhibitions. Um, they're kind of like academic exhibitions that have um, a lot of sort of information and essays and work around um, thinking about art in, in the sort of carceral space, um, its kind of function, um, and in, also outside of it, and also like um, as another way to kind of like talk about um, a, a different narrative, right, for the public to see. And I think she um, is a really kind of like sharp person and like frames it and does it well. Mm -hmm. um, and then also Michelle Jones is a person who's participating in a symposium. I don't know when, um, but it's sort of slightly different than your question, but I think that there's a number of ways that she's a really incredible human being. There's a project that she's working on that's fantastic, but also um, she, when she sort of speaks and thinks about um, um, uh, creating the language around just like sort of articulating what's happening, um, she has like, uh, is writing a kind of uh, scholarly work in collaboration with people who are currently incarcerated and just like thinking about like um, um, uh, the kind of like uh, ways that uh, the individuals who are participating are credited as researchers or as scholars and as theater practitioners um, and she does some theater work um, with different various people who have different types of proximity to the sort of carceral space um, and so I think the language around the way that she frames it and what she's doing is super important. Yeah. We have one final question in the back. Good morning, again, and thank you guys for what you're doing. 
um, at the risk of literally bite the hand that feeds me. Um, you guys have talked a lot in your artwork about both the law enforcement or uniform personnel uh, as well as the prisons themselves. Uh, has there been any thought given to the idea of looking at what uh, prosecutors bring to the table? Because again, law enforcement, if you're looking from it, at, the, at it from a policeman's perspective, they're actually enforcing the laws that are on the books. The prisons are actually housing those individuals that have in fact been convicted. But ultimately, it is the prosecutor who makes the determination as to what charges are brought against individuals and how much time that they will in fact get while they are inside a, a, a correctional institution. So have you given any thought to that or have you purposely not uh, looked at that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not something I talk about in my uh, art practice particularly, but I think maybe, I don't know, people would classify other things that I do in my world as a part of the art practice, maybe. Um, but I think those distinctions are not important to me. Um, but um, I also uh, have worked, have consulted, and continue to work or mentor in a number of different youth diversion programs specifically. Um, so in New York City, because this is where I currently live, um, and there's an organization called Recess, which a collaborator of mine, Sean Leonardo, will do a workshop about tomorrow, I don't know when anything happens, but in the book, Sean Leonardo, Mary Elko Tilt will talk more in depth about this project, which is now sort of housed in this arts organization called Recess Assembly. Um, and basically we run a diversion program there uh, where we work with Brooklyn Justice Initiative um, and a number of um, other uh, other individuals in the district attorney's office to um, basically have uh, participants sentenced to participate in an art program. And then if we say they've satisfied the program without any oversight or kind of like monitoring from anyone in the Justice Department's office, um, then their cases are closed and eventually their records get sealed. Um, so that's ways that I participated directly with like uh, thinking about conversations with prosecutors, but that's more practical sort of on the ground work, but not in the art practice proper, you know? I actually don't do legal work or anything like that. I'm a sociologist, so I think that's an important space to, to look at, but I, I, I mean, I can't answer that question. Great, I think that's about our time. Thank you to Simone and Sable and to all of you for coming this morning.